Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 697. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 2nd, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could join us and, and listen to us as we talk about all the Anglican news out there in the world. Some of the Christian news, that, well, you know, Anglican Christian, well, we'll work out the details as we go. And some secular news like climate change. We'll talk about it all today because that's what we get to do as pontificators of the news. We get to talk about it. George, how you been doing this week? Wonderful week. Oh. A lot of pastoral crises at the church, but you know, I just see the work of the Lord. Uh, people are going to think I'm a broken record, Kevin, are, but yeah. I got to tell you, there's no better life that one can lead than being a parish priest in a congregation that knows and loves the Lord. There's no better life than being called to be a parish priest. I've seen many parish priests who were not called, and I'm like, what are they doing? But you, as a called parish priest, are living a wonderful called life, yes. Well, I feel like a recruiting poster for people who want to go into the ministry. Yes, it's as good as you can imagine it. Now, for those who think they're going to run little fiefdoms, who think that <laughs> just because they've got a collar, people are going to listen to them, i got a big surprise for you. It's not true. But if you want to live a life where the Lord is active in every moment of your waking day, it's fantastic. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, we are still in Florida for the next, until March, my location is Florida. I've come here to enjoy the red ants, the coral snakes, the rattlesnakes, the uh, stink bugs, and all that Florida has to offer those people who show up at the RV resort. <laughs> no taxes. No taxes. No income taxes. No. Uh, beautiful, beautiful weather. Lovely people. Mm -hmm. so there's some good stuff about Florida. Good government. Yeah, I mean, Florida, the benefits of Florida far outweigh uh, the the detractors, thank God. Low, lowest COVID infection rate, one of the lowest in the nations, mm -hmm. with one of the most, some would say, lax COVID restriction laws. Mm -hmm. Healthy economy, has not been hit by uh, brand dynamics yet, so uh, no good time. So this is, I'm not going to give you updates anymore of where I am until next March when we hit the road again or April, whenever that happens. Uh, I am here. Uh, lots of news stories. Before we get too far, this is the point in the show where you participate. Please click the like button if you have not shared this program in a long, long, long time. This is the one you're going to want to share, especially if you're in the Church of England. If you have not commented in the comment section, now's your chance. We do really want to know what you, you have to say about what we talk about, about other ideas you want us to talk about, and about whatever you want to talk about. That's what the comment section is for. It's for you to express yourself. Um, if you have not subscribed to the show yet, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, there's nothing I can say. We're almost to 7,000 subscribers, which in the YouTube universe, that, that's like a, a grain of sand on a beach. However, in the Anglican universe, I think that's tops. I, I can't think of any other Anglican show that has 7,000 subscribers. We have hit the mega pinnacle of our success, George. Even though there's millions of Anglicans, we may just, we may, boom, 7,000, that's it. So, you know. They say there are 90 million Anglicans in the world. So folks, we've got a bit, bit more uh, growth available to us. There's a lot of market out there. Um, and if you want to listen to us on the way to work, for those who still have jobs, uh, we have a podcast only audio format of Anglican Unscripted. You can find that in the show notes on YouTube. Lots of stories out there. George, we're going to start with a good story because it's nuns versus the government. Uh, here it's the uh, um, Sisterhood of St. Mary have prevailed against the government of New York. What's the story, George? Sisterhood of St. Mary, I think they're in Greenwich, New York. Uh, we're in the Episcopal Church, but when Bishop Love uh, withdrew from the Episcopal Church, I think they also went. And they are now a religious uh, order under the jurisdiction of the Anglican Church in North America. And Archbishop George Carey is their Episcopal visitor. They, along with some Catholic religious orders and the Catholic Diocese of Albany, 
filed a lawsuit against the state of New York because the state of New York compelled them to ha offer health insurance with abortion coverage. Well, the nuns had two arguments. We don't want to pay for something. We're all nuns. We don't need abortion coverage. But two, this is morally abhorrent to us. We it's cannot evil. spend yeah. our we cannot spend our money on something that we believe is inherently evil and is against God's law. And they took this through the courts and they lost in the state of New York, the New York Court of Appeals. And they appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court on November 1st, yesterday, handed down a ruling overturning the state of New York's Supreme, Supreme Appellate a Court of Appeals ruling telling them to think again in light of some federal case precedents. So the nuns have won a major victory against the government of New York, and we'll see how the courts in New York respond. Yeah, this has been covered before in other states where religious municipalities and not-for-profits have gone before uh, the appeals courts in those states and said, listen, on moral grounds, we don't want this type of health insurance. Hobby Lobby did that, uh, and, and others. And they won. And mm -hmm. here the Supreme Court saying, you know, we gave the victories to others. That a victory applies to the Sisterhood of St. Mary as well. So, um, so it, this is a, it's just a, a win for religious liberty. It's mm -hmm. a win for uh, common sense. Um, but the heart of but Kevin, you're absolutely right. The, the U.S. Supreme Court's been down this road with other nuns, with other entities, and they've already held handed down this ruling. It's just that some states, New York, Illinois, California, refuse to countenance what the U.S. Supreme Court has held and continue to, I don't want to say persecute, but continue to basically discriminate against the religious orders on religious viewpoints. Well, religious viewpoints. I would argue that it is discrimination if you're forcing to do something that um, is consciously abhorrent, uh, abortion, uh, that you're forcing the nuns here to pay for it, even though they clearly will never get one. Um, that is persecution. You know, you're just doing it to, to be mean. You don't need the extra money. Uh, Planned Parenthood is doing just fine, even, even when it lost its federal funding under the Trump administration. It was flush with money because people donate to that cause. You know, we uh, a liberal uh, extremist gets up in the morning, I have not killed enough babies today. Where do I send my check? <laughs> it's well, like, it, it does say something about the state of the United States because we're seeing a real division in the states. Hmm. Um, the Illinois legislature just passed a law removing conscience clause for medical professionals who may be compelled to perform abortions. The state of Vermont uh, pursued an uh, a obstetrics nurse who refused to do an abortion. Uh, she was fired by the hospital. The Trump administration supported her in a lawsuit and the Biden administration dropped the lawsuit. Whereas in places like Florida, for instance, or Texas, the government is quite clear and firm in allowing religious objections to vaccines uh, to basically trying to abortion is uh, fast disappearing in Florida so you can go from you can cross a state line and just have radically different abortion laws uh, vaccination mandates gun laws uh, we really are becoming a nation that is more and more divided uh, by regions and states yeah, and my wife and I have this conversation before, uh, last night and the night before. Why is the populace so divided now? And I opinioned, and my wife accepted my opinion. Very, happens very infrequently, but she said, "You know, that makes sense." I said, "A lot of it is just you know the access to information, the internet." Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to go to the library, the public library, and look up reference magazines and go through the little index cards to, to learn more information. You can go right now and Google anything you want. Now, you are limited to what Google thinks you should know. Um, if you go up there on Google right now and you uh, um, search climate change doubt, 
it will take you to all the websites that that uh, tell you that climate change is real and there is no doubt. If you say mm-hmm. um, uh, Google Trump election miscount or fraud, it will tell you all the websites that uh, no, no, there's no fraud here. You know, it, Google does point you in the direction they want. Therefore, it is not um, going to help in anything other than continued uh, animosity between sides. It's instant yeah. information that is uh, vetted by other people. That's my you know, philosophy. We live, in a low inf- we live in a low information society. We have so much information. Mm-hmm that people consciously tune out or no, don't even care to look at opposing sides. Uh, we mentioned Terry Mattingly last week in his uh, uh, his uh, column. I worked for Terry for a number of years and the, the prim- on the, the Get Religion website, where Get Religion would was professional journalists. Uh, I was one of them who would do critique, literary criticism of other journalism. And one of the things we'd always hit about is you have to be able to present both sides, balance, so that the, an educated reader would come a, a reader would come away educated, informed about the opinions of both sides, and then be able to make up their own mind. Nowadays, that's the norm. That's his classical American, Anglo-American journalism. That's absolutely journalism. One hundred and one is first paragraph outlines the story. Second paragraph outlines one side of the story, third paragraph the other side of the story, and the fourth paragraph is the conclusion, and sometimes the ideas of the author, but the concluding paragraph. You have both both sides in there. Now, that's, that's a rarity. And in fact, we had the public editor of the New York Times about a year or two ago say, well, we don't do that anymore. Yeah. We don't print all the news that's fit to print. We print what you need to know to be able to come to right thought. Those are my words. But we, Joseph Goebbels, the uh, Nazi uh, propaganda minister, believed in the big lie. If you repeat a lie often enough and forbid the other side from getting their word out, eventually people, the average man in the street, is going to believe the big lie, even though he can look in front of him and he sees his Jewish neighbors and they're not monsters and all this and that. If you spend six, seven, eight years telling people they're monsters and there's no... Uh, not, no voice against it. Who are you going to believe? Your lying eyes, or or the, uh, the or your trusted media? Yeah, it, it's a great example, um, and we see that all the time. We saw that certainly in uh, George Orwell's book, 1984, the memory hole, the rewriting of history. History can be so rewritten, uh, and it's happening today, uh, that people will believe the new history. Uh, climate change, as we'll talk about in, in a moment, is one of those uh, that we've lived through uh, a long uh, million years, multi-million years of, of climate history that shows us climate change for millions of years. All of a sudden, it's freakish now. Well, we'll talk about that as we, we get to it. Um, we, as a uh, populace, only have a memory of five years when we're dealing with history of thousands of years and climate history of millions of years. And uh, uh, people can take advantage of our short memories, which benefits the news and benefits a news uh, entity that wants to make money. They make money out of fear. Uh, They make money out of the headlines. How do I attract a person to my headline and not somebody else's headline? Well, I make it an emergency. I make it life or death. I have to compel the reader and you know so many wonder, wonderful headline editors do that to read my article you know <laughs> michael jackson drops his second glove isn't going to get a lot of people to read the paper you know but it is what it is george we have lots michael of, jackson michael jackson the archbishop of dublin no no the one the other michael Mike, jackson the other michael oh, okay, jackson the other one yeah, yeah the other one the the the, uh, the thriller guy um, let's talk about other news. I got uh, four of the stories. I'm not sure what order we should take it, but we, we t- just talked about uh, the Nazis and the propaganda. Do you want to do climate change right now, or do you want to do liberation theology first, George? It, no, let's, co-host let's, let's choice. Let's get our Nazi, Nazi themes uh, going. <laughs> okay. So Archbishop Justin Welby 
said, I don't want this week's Anglican Unscripted to be boring. What could I do? I want to help out Kevin and George as they talk about Anglican news. And he, he goes on the BBC radio and he gives us some wonderful quotes and gives an apology. And we're going to talk about that news, the news around it, and why there are so many doubting Thomases when it comes to climate change or human uh, affected, affected climate change. George, what did Justin say and where is he to say it? Well, on Sunday began COP26, a global conference of uh, leaders from around the world to discuss ways to um, uh, alleviate a man-made global climate change, global warming, global cooling, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Welby was on the BBC, I believe it was Radio 4, and he offered his hopes, and the, the, uh, the interview started off well. Now, I don't necessarily agree with Justin Welby's position. Justin Welby is a climate uh, change uh, alarmist, if you will. That, that's not a fair thing, but he, he does believe he, that if we don't act believer. immediately... He's a yes, true believer. He like, yeah. like Prince Charles, like Al Gore, like a lot of people, that if we don't act immediately, things are going to be terrible. Um, well, that, that's a point of view. He then went on to say, I, and the leaders uh, uh, will be cursed if they don't act. Okay, that's a strong thing. Cursed like you, just like, you know, uh, let's go Brandon cursed or the curse of God will be upon them. Okay, the Archbishop's talking. Let's, let's listen a little closer. And then he explained that uh, just like politicians in the 1930s are now chastised for not acting against the rising Nazi menace, politicians who do not take action against climate change now in future generations will be uh, criticized. Ouch. Now, that's, that's a strong argument, but it is an argument. And frankly, you and I have used that for people who, politicians who turn their eyes against uh, radical Islam, mm -hmm. for instance, who uh, say that, well, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing there there in the assault of radical Islam on Western culture and values. We've used that analogy. So that's not something to be beaten up. Then he crossed the line. He said that, and in, the, and in the future, people will look back on those politicians as being responsible for a genocide that was worse than the Nazis' genocide. And they will have the blood on their hands of millions and millions of people for not having acted against climate change. So step one, he sets up his very strong views. Step two, he uses a Nazi analogy, which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Step three, he accuses those who do not agree with him for being worse than Nazis, for being Nazis, and wanting to have the death blood on their hands. Now, this caused an explosion immediately in certain quarters. The first was the Jewish press. Uh, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle got onto Twitter and say, how could this man even be a priest, let alone an archbishop? Because to equate the deliberate, planned, systematic murder of six million people with the uh, climate change debate is just ludicrous. And then the Telegraph jumped in. Some of their columnists jumped in and said, yeah, just been well, but you got to go. This is just ridiculous. Justin then apologized and put out a, an apology saying he was uh, very contrite. He didn't mean to offend the Jewish people. But that didn't seem to do it because other politicians came out and other people came out basically saying, Justin, you're an embarrassment. You got to go. Yeah, now, I don't well, necessarily yeah, I, think this is the point reason why you should go. No. But, well, here's where we stop. George and I accept apologies. Okay, he, he was right to apologize in this Christian world. When somebody apologizes for doing something wrong, we accept it and we move on. There's still consequences for what happened. Mm -hmm. What Justin said will have consequences uh, for a long time. Will he lose his job over it? Who knows? But let, let's, let's just stop right here. In the Christian kingdom, somebody said they're sorry, they repented. Boom. Okay. We're back in a level playing field. 
good, but there's still consequences. And so let's deal with some of those consequences. Is this something uh, an archbishop should lose their job for, George? In the Church of England, an archbishop is not a spiritual leader as much as he is the head of the chief executive of a quasi-governmental agency. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he's held a different set of standards of political accountability, political acumen. And if the archbishop is an embarrassment to the Church of England, they really need to consider whether it's time that he take a graceful retirement. Because Justin Welby, unfortunately, has had a number of gaffes, such as denouncing predatory lending from uh, 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 quick loan companies. And then it turns out the Church of England is heavily invested in these companies. Heavily. And in other words, and he, he just has, uh, and uh, he beats up on Africans for not following Lambeth 110, but gives Americans, Canadians a pass on 110. Um, that may not make, mean much to the uh, average person in the street in England, but for the Anglican world, there's a, there's a degree of hypocrisy. Peter Hitchens, a noted columnist, had an article in the Daily Mail where he savaged Justin Welby for being a hypocrite. This is before the Nazi comments. Mm -hmm. um, from a PR perspective, if a secular organization, when you've reached the point where he's ridicule, where you just can't take the man seriously anymore, he's got to go. From a religious perspective, we don't operate that way, uh, and we we forgive people, and we uh, and we look to their moral character and to the clarity of their moral teaching. And you and I have, you know, criticized his political talk, but we I think we've really been more exercised by his the lack of the fruits of the spirit in his work, and the things that he says that we do not believe accord with uh, scripture and uh, the. Uh, traditions of the church. Well, I've been trying to think, when I read this quote last night, uh, other gaffes of other uh, archbishops of Canterbury. And I can think of two of Rowan Williams' gaffes that didn't cost him his job. One, he attended and became a Druid. Maybe it was a ceremonial thing, um, but for whatever reason, that did not play well. And, and, and the press, the English press, got a hold of that and said, what are you doing? Okay, the Lord of the Rings movies are out. It's kind of cool. But no, no, you, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leader of the Anglican Communion, should not be uh, made a Druid. And then the, the Sharia interview he did about the, the value of having Sharia law in English society was probably the second biggest gaffe I can think of from a one was. But other than that, he survived those. Um, yeah, because but, because in each of those cases, Rowan Williams did not evince malice for those who disagreed with him. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I may have thought, you know, if we listen to his explanations, Rowan Williams had, uh, if you will, forgotten that he was no longer a professor who can talk about both sides of an issue. Very well. Yeah. But he was the leader of the Anglican world, and to say that Sharia law in England was okay in the midst of rising uh, radicalism in Islam, that was a mistaken sentiment to voice. But if you look at the value of Sharia law in itself, that's a different issue if you're looking at it as a scholar. But he never, he never offered any malice to those who disagreed with him. Hmm. And Justin Welby in this comment uh, has offered a degree of malice. Uh, those who disagree with the sort of liberal bourgeois line about anything are Nazis. And he's that, demonizing the opposition. And I always use the opposition here, uh, in this case, liberal periodicals, in researching climate change. And when The Atlantic, The Hill, and some of the more liberal uh, magazines, online magazines out there are saying... We read the report. It doesn't seem that there is an emergency. It doesn't seem that the climate is changing due to human concerns or human influences. Uh, I, I take that to heart. Why are the liberals not on board with this? And so 
Um, I'm going to post a link to three different articles that uh, talk about everything from the hockey sick to the latest report that they're discussing right now over in Europe. Um, and okay. yeah, Kevin, and there's and there's one thing I think that I think that we try consciously to do. Mm -hmm. If we disagree with someone, that does not mean we hate them. It does not mean there are some outlets out there on the conservative side, media outlets on the liberal side, that if you don't agree with them, you are evil. And you are... Uh, I can remember when I was going through the ordination process, my bishop at the time was Charles Benison in Philadelphia. Love your and Benison... And Benison uh, said to me at one point, George, I can't believe you believe in this literal resurrection of a virgin birth. Uh, you're, you're not a stupid man, so you're either dishonest or crazy. And I actually do believe in the resurrection and, and the virgin birth and all this stuff, but rather than be able to talk about this, it was... If you don't agree, you're either evil or stupid. And that that mindset has so infected both both sides in the Anglican controversies that I don't think we're going to ever be able to get through it unless we return to the central dictum of Christ to love our neighbor. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and also love your enemy. Now, I've been part of the Anglican political wars for lack of a better term, for a long time, since uh, 2005 or six, long time. And I remember one of the most vivid memories I have is being at some event in Texas where all the, it wasn't ACTA back then, they were the ACN uh, back then, mm -hmm. uh, and lots of bishops were all gathered talking about, you know, how do we go forward, how do we deal with the, the hostile um, House of Bishops in the Episcopal Church, and this is when the 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 deposing was starting. You know, uh, Catherine Jeffers Shorey, and somebody got a phone call on the cell phone, and said, I, "I just heard that Bishop Brunel has cancer." And the whole room went quiet, and I, I don't know if it's Ackerman or Bishop Eicher stood up and said, "Let us pray." And they prayed for an enemy to what the, you know they were doing. They prayed for somebody who, um, out of just pure love, was their brother at that moment. And I'm like, wow. Wow, what a humbling moment in time. And it's also, you know, Kevin and I have been pretty harsh about Michael Nazarelli. Mm -hmm. We love Michael yeah, Nazarelli. Absolutely. We pray yeah. for Michael Nazarelli. He's mm -hmm. a wonderful human being. He's a godly man. He's a mm -hmm. righteous man. Yeah. He's someone that we should emulate. I think he made a mistake, and I don't agree with what he did. Yeah. But just because I don't agree with him doesn't in any way lessen his integrity and his decency. He just, I think, chose wrongly. Yeah, yeah there's, <laughs> uh, there's no other way and, to... And, to, and, to, and, to and, if, and if we lose the ability to love people hmm. who we disagree with, then, folks, I don't think you've ever had kids, <laughs> or at least teenagers. <laughs> <sighs> oh, what tattoo do we have today? It's like, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, um, the kingdom, the the importance of all of what we we're talking about here, um, has to be part of our lives and uh, our daily lives and our daily walk. George and I don't sit down here with malice and say, well, who we're going to talk about today. You know, we, we're here to talk about Christian issues that are happening around the earth, uh, especially within the Anglican communion, because we want to encourage the body. Kevin, how can bad news be encouraging? I don't know. God has forever shown that he can use evil for good. Okay. You look, look at all the characters in the Bible, and we're going to have to talk about the bad things that happen out there. We talk about the good things that happen out there as well, by demand of the audience. <laughs> and, you know, it, but it works because we are Christians. At the end of the day, we don't have any malice uh, towards those that we're speaking of. Now, Kevin and I do 
Kevin's a Midwesterner, I'm a Floridian, he's from the Midwest, I'm from the East. But we're of the same generation, uh, if you will, those who grew up in the Reagan years. Trickle down. And, and, and we're very American. And so that forms our consciousness so that the liberty of conscience is something that's almost, uh, it's assumed. Uh, in other words, you, the right you have the right to believe what you believe. I don't have to agree with you, but you have the right. You have the right to be stupid. Uh, I hate to say it that way, but you know the we, the liberty of conscience and that compulsion in thinking is just so foreign to our understanding of what uh, adult life is like. Yeah, and well, we bring that into our religious discussions. Yeah, and I grew up in a time where I was reading about the Soviet gulags. I, you know, in, in the 80s, I was reading the George Orwells. I was reading Alexander about... Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And read all that, you know. Um, I even read Liberation Theology. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there was a time in the 80s and 90s where I was, you know, uh, trying to, well before the internet was there to help me, uh, become educated in, in so many things because I was experiencing the freedom I wanted other people to experience the freedom. How could I make that happen? And that's kind of that, that American lens we have. Um, and it's certainly been the American lens of some of our foreign policy. How can we spread democracy? How can we influence other, govern, uh, other governments to leave totalitarianism aside and, and let the people vote for what they want? And in many cases, most recently, we've seen people uh, vote for things that are just completely beyond the scale of the freedom we were hoping they would uh, try to achieve. So I've taken all that acumen now into my brain and I'm a little less of the 80s Kevin I used to be. I'm, you know, uh, but I still have that American lens and you have that American lens. I have a, a, a very uh, Christian lens uh, and a very Anglican lens. And I don't think it's possible for you to have one of those flock of seagulls hairstyles. Anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> if you look at my my nineteen eighty four graduation photo, you're like, is that the band member from Flock of Seagulls? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I've noticed recently, and you probably can't tell on the camera, but am I going gray? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> You're older than I, and that, there's not one gray hair on your head. George, let's move on. Um, anything else you want to say about climate change? There, There's doubt in climate change because um, the liberals are doubting, and that's where I, I point to it. And it was made a real good, important article that the only climate change that's human-driven is found in the computer models. Okay, I get it. I get it. You know, mm -hmm. and who makes the computer models? Not the climate, but the humans. Um, but I'm going to post those articles uh, in the story notes on YouTube. Just click there and you, you can read them for yourselves. And this is a great chance to talk about climate change, whether you believe in it, which you should. The moment God said, let there be light, the climate has been changing. I don't disagree with that. Um, and how much human influence do you think there is? This, I don't mind that debate happening in the comment section. George, I mentioned liberal uh, liberation theology, we may as well talk about it because somebody thought critical race theory was not enough for their diocese. Let's move one step crazier. Um, let's talk liberation theology. Why are we talking about this, George? Well, we need to credit Jeff Walton at Juicy Ecumenism and the IRD mm -hmm. for a wonderful article about liberation theology and the diocese of churches for the sake of others. They're friends. I've written it down, so I didn't mangle the name. C four S O. It's not Christ for the sake of others. It's not commissions for the sake of others. It's church for the sake of others. Absolutely. Of others. Uh, October was Hispanic Heritage Month, I believe, mm -hmm. and the bishop Todd Hunter wrote to the clergy asking ideas how we can celebrate Hispanic heritage. And one of the ideas that came back was offering uh, theological resources that have come out of the Hispanic world. And one uh, priest, uh, Sean McCain, the rector of Resurrection in South Austin in Texas, uh, had proposed Gustavo Gutierrez, the liberation theologian from Peru, as a resource for the C4SO. And Jeff uh, interviewed uh, uh, Father uh, McCain for you the article. Keep talking. Somebody started a leaf blower. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh my. Jeff. And he blew away the thought that was in my mind too with that leaf blower. <laughs> but Jeff interviewed Father McCain, and Father McCain expressed his uh, appreciation for the works of Gustavo Gutierrez. And Jeff pointed out that this has been condemned by Gutierrez is a uh, Roman Catholic priest uh, from Peru. But the Catholic Church under John Paul II and Benedict has fiercely condemned liberation theology. Mm -hmm. um, it has uh, been denounced as a heresy. It seeks to meld Christianity and Marxism and is just uh, well, an aberration, in my opinion. Now, I don't think McCain is consciously seeking to introduce Marxism into the C4SO theological milieu. Uh, I'm sure he's young, and it's exciting to read these things, this forbidden fruit and knowledge. But it's a little scary for me that people like Matt Kennedy have to do the jobs of the bishops in pointing out the errors of some of these theological trends that we're seeing pop up. I'll say in the ACNA, because that's who we're talking about, be mm -hmm. it liberation theology, be it the name it and claim it gospel, the prosperity gospel. We've had these things pop up, and the bishops have not really taken the lead in stamping it out. At least the bishops aren't doing this publicly, but I've seen correction within the church before. I was at an event at the Church of the Resurrection where a visiting uh, priest from Latin America was giving the, the opening prayer. And I was listening to it on the, the translation. They had little headsets for us Americana gringos to listen to the, uh, uh, the event. And uh, this prayer was as liberation theology as you get. It was right out of this book. Okay, it was, it was classic. And I know I've read liberation theology. And I was like, I can't put this on the air. I can't release this as Anglican TV. And right next to me was a bishop from a um, Western diocese. I don't want to tell you which one because I don't need this to work. I don't want you to figure out who this was, but I want to tell you what happened. He stood up. He went to this priest. He uh, ushered him off stage and he corrected him right there, right then on his theology, not in front of everybody. But to the point where half an hour later, um, this bishop and this priest came back to the microphone and this priest apologized for what he was said and was said and, and said what he said was an error. Correction works. This uh, priest just was not aware of, uh, of this because for whatever reason, he was corrected by an ACNA bishop, not in a very public way, but um, enough so that Kevin noticed and uh, the little sweat beads in my, my forehead started to disappear a little Whew, good <laughs> crisis averted and so yes I've seen correction happen but Matt Kennedy should not be the guy out there uh, correcting every error we see on the uh, uh, on the internet and bishops do need to hold their clergy accountable especially in this day and age of social media the day and age of instagram and facebook somebody has to be there to say you are not representing our faith correctly your faith correctly or the church correctly and just as justin welby had no problem apologizing mm -hmm. for the mistake he made in equating nazis with climate change skeptics um i don't think we should be fearful of correcting ourselves when we've misspoken. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you and I have made some gaffes, many, many gaffes. Not oh, many, many, a couple here or there. Come on. <laughs> in, each, in each show. Uh, yes. <laughs> and and the point is that the, we are out there to uh, pursue the truth, not to pursue our own uh, uh, stat, status. Mm -hmm. And, well, I come from a mindset that the bishop's office is primarily a pastoral office and a teaching office and if it's a dictating office uh, where this is what it is and that's that and there's no teaching there's no pastoral work it really is ineffective as a bishop mm -hmm. so I mean the example you cited is a wonderful example wonderful example but I think it should go even further and for the bishop to let the people know why this fellow was mistaken mm -hmm and to engage people with dialogues because if you just tell if you just tell some young 
person who's watching a conference that you can't think this way, uh, you have to think this way, they're not going to do it. Or, you know, if they have a, if, well, they'll rebel. Yeah. And you're not doing anything to further their, their walk in with Christ. Yeah. You're closing a door rather than opening it. So, back to uh, Christ uh, Church for the Sake of Others. Um, this is a continued issue, George. We started with the critical race theory. Um, I really, I like a lot of what Bishop Hunter does. Uh, I've spoken to him in the past. We've had lunch before. Um, he has some marvelous ideas of reaching the young people, reaching millennials, reaching Gen Z. Um, he has a proven record of reaching uh, the younger people within uh, the, the geography he's at. But I, I find that there's a lack of correcting some of his priests uh, online a, a little worrisome, George. There's the difference between technique and content. Mm -hmm. um, he has excellent technique. Mm -hmm. you, you're correct. He is able to reach uh, uh, people in ways a few other ACNA bishops can. Mm -hmm. But the content that is going through those channels of communication needs to be correct. And it needs to be in accordance with the received uh, truth of the church and of Jesus Christ. Um, otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for a terrible catastrophe. Indeed. All right, let's move on to some more stuff. Oh, we need to talk about uh, two more topics, uh, specifically Egypt. Um, new leadership over there. Uh, and I was kind of wondering, you know, in the pre-show, is this pro or not pro Gafgan? Just kind of, yeah. Well, Sami Shahada, mm -hmm. the new Archbishop of uh, Alexandria, has uh, appointed an assistant bishop, uh, Anthony Ball. Anthony Ball is uh, a priest of the Church of England, a canon of Westminster Abbey, and his job, he's the rector of St. Margaret's, which is the church for Parliament. Mm -hmm. And Canon Ball has now, will now be his assistant bishop. And what this is telling me is that uh, the Gafcon door is not going to open under Archbishop Sammy. That uh, the glo it, Sammy is putting his, uh, his marbles in the Global South movement. Because the, who you hire sort of gives an idea of where you wish to take your team and to hire a, this uh, bishop elect ball was a chaplain to rowan williams he's an establishment and i know nothing bad about him i think it's a wonderful appointment and i pray that the lord work bless his ministry but from a political perspective i don't think gafcon as a movement should be pleased i think the global south should be pleased because now they've got a skilled administrator working at the heart of the Global South movement. Yeah, I mean, we've talked before uh, about, you know, the influence of the Sea of Canterbury. And some people still think there's a, enough of an influence that they want to be part of that, uh, that scope. Others see it as defunct and are looking for other uh, religiosity elsewhere. So we'll have to see what happens. George? See, it, yeah, okay, go ahead. No, no. I was going to uh, switch well, topics. No, I was just going to add, you know, you, you know, Meneer and Nice, you know, had Harry Goodhue, the former Archbishop of Sydney, Very correct, come yes. for many years mm -hmm. to uh, Cairo, and you could sort of see where it went when you had Harry Goodhue from Sydney. Now you've sort of got someone from the opposite side of the, the, of the spectrum, if you will. Uh, and so we'll see which way the church is taken now. Yeah. Okay. Last topic on today's show uh, is the continued, <sighs> dare, dare, we, the word destruction, certainly persecution, uh, in Sudan. Um, it, it's sad that we have to continue to report this in the 21st century, that we're more worried about the climate than we are uh, countries that are in just absolute turmoil. And our brothers and sisters in Christ are going to be losing their lives over this, George. Yes, uh, the Archbishop of Sudan, Ezekiel Kondo, was uh, was able to be was 
the Diocese of Salisbury in England has a link with Sudan. Mm -hmm. And the, the fellow there was able to reach Archbishop Kondo and Khartoum uh, over the cell phone. And things are very tense in the capital. And we, uh, the Archbishop asked for prayers because it seems the Islamists are back in power. The uh, people behind the military coup are looking to reestablish Sharia law as the national law. And that the Christian community which has made some strides under the democratic traditional government, transitional government, is quite fearful and they're starting to see signs that all of that progress will be lost. We're gonna go back to the bad old days of overt persecution, uh, murder of Christians, destruction of churches, and that's in the cities. And But if we go down to the Nupa Mountains where there's been a long time war against the Christians in the Nupa Mountains, that may there's a fear that that's going to pick up dramatically because that's where the money is underneath the ground with the oil and the mineral rights in the Nova Mountain area. Any stories that we're saving for Friday, George? No, we got some, we got for a couple. Friday, okay. yeah, we got a couple, but just want to mention in passing the death of Bernard Malongo, mm -hmm. a friend, acquaintance of Kevin and I. Bernard was the former Archbishop of Central Africa. A very jocular fellow. Uh, we got to know him quite well at the Pittsburgh conference all those years ago, yeah. and at various uh, primates meetings. Uh, he passed away. He is. He was from Malawi, and uh, he just died on the 30th of October. Mm. So we pray for his family and for the repose of his soul. Absolutely, on All Souls Day. On All Souls Day. Oh, that's cool. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 697 of Anglican Unscripted.